The premise of our discussion today is expressed in this quote from Catherine Hayhoe in reference to climate change. If we don't talk about it, we won't care about it. And if we don't care about it, we won't change it. We won't get involved. Um, and that is the basic premise, how to encourage more climate conversations, what stands in the way, and how to have them across differences, because um, I think that is in large part um, is, is one of the barriers that allows climate conversations to happen. So we have three um, amazing panelists with us today, and I'm going to hand off to my co-moderator, um, Becky Edwards, who's the executive director at Mountain Mamas, to introduce our panelists in a fun way. And I'm going to drop their official bios into the chat for you to read. <laughs> Thank you, Winona, and so great to see everyone tonight. Thank you so much for making the time. I know we're all busy and swamped and hopping on others. You might not be at the top of your list, but it's such good, um, important work. So thank you for being here. Um, I don't know how many of you have been through the Leadership Montana process. I am currently um, in Leadership Montana this session, and it's been really fun and a uh, great way to see the state and connect with a lot of other folks, but a few different ways that we introduce folks um, at Leadership Montana is by asking some kind of maybe not, you know, not exactly listing your CV or your resume, but asking a few questions to learn, share folks a little bit more about you. So we've got three really amazing panelists today. <clears throat> um, and I'd love for each three of them, I'm, each of them, I'm gonna ask you three questions each and we can maybe start with Dr. Whitlock. Um, and if you'll just unmute and, I'll <laughs> and just try and make it as brief as possible. We try and just focus on one or two words, but uh, what was your first job? I was in the furniture section of the Denver dry goods department store in Denver. Very good. <laughs> Um, what would be the name of your autobiography? Hmm. I don't know. Um, she tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and you can, we can always circle back on that one too, if we need to. Um, and then what brings you joy? Oh, going on a nice hike, reading a good book, spending time with my grandkids. Wonderful. And definitely encourage you guys, Winona just dropped um, Dr. Kathy Whitlock's uh, bio there in the chat. So check that out. But just wanted to say thank you to her for being with us today. Um, Nadia White, would you be interested in going next? If you'll unmute mute you yourself. Bet. Awesome. So same three questions. What was your first job? I'm having a hard time remembering the first time somebody expected me to show up, but I ran a constant um, line of entrepreneurial things on my dead end street. So I think my first job was selling tomatoes at a table on the corner of Linden Lane and Spruce Street. Um, when, and I was young. I used to just fall asleep next to my stand and people would just put money in my box and take a tomato. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, what would be the name of your autobiography? <laughs> Um, I think like the hard way. I've been accused of just always doing things the hard way. So maybe that's true. A lot of us. Uh, I have some similarities there. Um, and what brings you joy? I'm probably doing things the hard way. <laughs> um, well, I, I this time of year just love some quiet skiing with a happy dog. I, I love being outside with my dog. Wonderful. Well, and again, um, Dr. White's uh, profile there is in the chat. So please check that out. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. And last but definitely not least, um, Dave Morris, uh, if you'll unmute yourself and then I'll ask you those same ones. Um, what was your first job? Uh, I believe my first semi real job was uh, working on an oyster farm on the Olympic Peninsula. Very yep. fun. It's pretty up there. Very pretty. Um, what would be the name of your autobiography? Uh, something like uh, out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can be a little out there, but I also uh, love being out there uh, in the field uh, and exploring. So I think that might sort of encapsulate things. <laughs> Very good. Um, and then what brings you joy? 
Well, Nadia kind of stole mine. Uh, certainly this time of year, I love being out uh, skiing with friends or actually biking around my neighborhood with my dog, which is it's just lovely in the snow. Wonderful. Um, well, thanks all three of you for being with us. And I'm gonna kick this back to Winona to kind of get us started um, and kind of give you all a setup of how we're gonna move through the evening. Wonderful, thank you, Becky. Um, so we are gonna have three sections to today's discussion and we will make time for audience questions and stories and comments at the end of each section. Um, you can feel free to type things in the chat as we go and we'll do our best to get to them once we're to that Q&A piece at the end. Um, and if you are not speaking, uh, please be on mute, uh, even panelists, please just to minimize noise. Um, we thought we'd start the conversation tonight by jumping off with a memorable scene from Don't Look Up, which is the Netflix blockbuster film about a climate, uh, a climate, there, there you go, a comet about to hit the earth. And um, it's hilarious and a very disturbing allegory for our climate crisis and our struggle here to address it. And spoiler alert, if you have not seen the film and are concerned about not hearing the ending, we will be touching near the ending during this conversation. So I just wanted to point that out. So let's start with a clip from the film. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this goes well. <laughs> um, this moment feels so true for those of us who've been involved with the climate movement or involved with the science of the climate movement or involved with uh, you know, trying to communicate what's happening. Um, like DiCaprio's character, the overall strategy of the climate, enga of climate engagement um, has historically, in, in some spheres, has historically been to focus on science We've been trying to convince people to engage um, on climate change, that it's real um, and will have urgent consequences um, for our lives and for our children by shouting the science kind of louder and louder has been you know, one of the modes, although that is shifting. Um, Catherine Hayhoe, who I quoted at the beginning, shared with us last spring that sharing the science hasn't really moved the needle on um, political polarization around the issue. And that disinformation is certainly a factor, but so is just human psychology, um, such as confirmation bias. Yet when we shine another light on um, American beliefs or um, knowledge around climate change, um, we have to consider like, are the differences that polarized? Um, because 70% of Americans say they are at, are at least somewhat worried about global warming and 35% say they are very worried. But 61% of Americans rarely or never talk about global warming with family or friends. Nearly the same number of people who are somewhat concerned also don't talk about it. Those numbers are, I mean, they're 10 percentage points apart but they're still very close. And this number is stunning. So I wanna start with that's just kind of our frame and our setup for our panelists. And I want to start with the first question. Um, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Whitlock. Um, tell us about your efforts to reach people with information about climate change or to simply connect with them on related issues and what that has been like for you. I could so uncomfortably relate to Leonardo DiCaprio's role as a kind of a wonky from frumpy scientist trying to explain something um, to the public. So that was really, I was really enjoyed that film so much and I was really uncomfortable watching those guys. Um, the other thing that, that you didn't mention Winona is in that Yale survey about climate change, and I think this is really critical, that there's about 60% of the people, including in Montana, that don't think that climate change is going to affect them. And so we don't only not talk about it, but people don't see it as a problem that affects them. And, and I think that really is the gap in why we don't have more conversations about it. But um, we released the Montana Climate Assessment. And so in 2017, and then we went around the state talking to communities about climate change. We talked to anybody that's invited us, really. We've been in 
big towns, talking to library groups, small towns, nursing homes, schools, town halls, probably about, I don't know, 5,000 people in all, something like that. And um, it's been really, it's, it's hard for a scientist like me who hasn't you know, been out on the public road very much to go out and talk about something that you know is gonna be really controversial. And so along the way, a, a couple of things I've realized is that in Montana, you don't talk about climate change, you talk about changing climate. Um, somehow that makes a difference to people. You don't start out with the hockey stick curve of global warming because right away you've set up this this you know sort of debate or separation between you and the audience you know what scientists know versus what else is going on um, and so I've learned things like that I've also learned that you, it helps when you're talking about climate change to ask people what they've noticed sorry my cat just walked in yeah um, if what people have noticed about climate change themselves. Um, so, you know, what's happened since 1950? Because almost everybody in Montana that I've talked to knows that climate change is happening. That's a really common area. I mean, an area of agreement, of widespread agreement. I've never been sort of shouted down for, you know, the climate is not changing. People, people can see that and they're really interested in it. So the, those are, those are kind of the things that have worked for me and that I've kind of learned how to adapt, um, trying to find the common ground with the audience rather than just sort of telling them a bunch of facts. Thank so you. maybe I'll start with that. Okay, wonderful. Um, Nadia? Yeah. Um, not sure where you want me to spring off of from that. Um, Do you want me to repeat the, the question? You could answer. Go for sure, you. or I can uh, take off of where Kathy left off. Go ahead. Very helpful. Um, often enough, uh, I, most of my work uh, in, until like longer ago now, 15 years ago, was in Wyoming. Um, Montana and Missoula seem like um, great liberal bastions to me. Um, the a lot of those conversations that Kathy was talking about attending, though, there's often a journalist in the room for. The more public of those, and <clears throat> um, watching how the audience responds, and audience is really how we start thinking about stories, and um, and so that, as Kathy was saying, this this ever defined common ground um, for starting the conversation, if you're on the source end of things, which Kathy would be, um, for. Uh, reporters, it's often finding sources who are good at that and who can bridge the gap. And that I think has changed a tremendous amount in the 20 years that I've been um, covering climate issues or editing climate reporters, looking for non, for sources who, ever, who are kind of unimpeachable. And I come back time and again to crop insurance people, water ditch riders, um, people who are, whose job it is to be talking about change over time, actuarial, agricultural act, actuarialists. Um, and that can open the door in a way, as Kathy was saying, that doesn't turn people off, that keeps people engaged in the story. And then, and then uh, some stories are simply science stories, but to the extent that stories are about the impact of science in a world that we are all sharing, those finding those common sources can be a really important way to open the conversation to a broader audience. Thank you. Dave? Um, yeah, so I, uh, my main work is uh, instructing field courses for undergraduates on all sorts of conservation topics, but especially climate and energy for the last 15 years or so. Um, and in the course of that, we, we meet with all sorts of regular people out in communities uh, and sometimes in the backcountry. So we'll meet with ranchers and miners and elected officials, um, scientists, uh, land managers, lots of Native American uh, groups. And 
typically, uh, you know, as I think the the advice is now, we don't come straight at climate normally, unless that's explicitly what we're there to talk about. We talk about, you know, how it is raising your cattle this year, or what is the demand for coal and what's the trend in that? Um, uh, how much water is in the reservoir? How is fire affecting your, um, your farming operation or your community? And then sort of, you know, slide into the climate context of those issues as it's appropriate. Um, and, you know, building some kind of like relationship and also sort of figuring out where people are at. Um, you know, again, the six uh, Americas of climate uh, scale that uh, the Yale Climate Group has put together, I think is really useful to understand like where, where are people at and kind of uh, tune your approach to, to where they're starting from. Um, yeah, and then just also trying to, uh, um, especially if, if there's a great distance between where I'm at and where this person I'm talking with is, then uh, I learned from, from Nadia actually on a course that we taught last summer that being inquisitive and having kind of a journalist's um, attitude of, what I want is to hear the fullest expression of your opinion, whatever it is, and however you got there. Um, I want to understand that as well as I possibly can, uh, and not expect that I'm going to move them in any direction at all. Um, but with that sort of open inquiry, often those questions come back around to, to me or to our group, and we're able to, you know, just engage with climate issues um, based on kind of a mutual respectful relationship. So those are some of the things that, that we try to do. Wonderful, thank you, Dave. Um, well, now I'd love to hear just, you know, brief example, some brief examples of conversations. Obviously you don't, I'm not naming any names or, <laughs> you know, keeping it general, but of, you know, experiences where a climate conversation that you had went surprisingly well, and then maybe one where it didn't go well at all, <laughs> and maybe how you handled that situation. Dr. Whitlock? Um, I've talked to people of all ages, but it's amazing how many times I talk to people who are retired or over 60, so that's a little frustrating because um, I really like talking to younger people about this problem since they're the ones that that are going to inherit it. Um, but I, I've always had, you know, I've had pretty good conversations, um, and I've gotten some crazy. I've gotten some crazy questions that that kind of keep me on my toes. I had, I was talking, I was talking in um, Columbus, and somebody asked. They raised their hand and they said you know, why do we always get blamed for this? Why does the US always get blamed for climate change when we know that it's Vietnam that's really the problem? And it just kind of took me to a pause. And, um, but it was, it was a question that was asked in good faith, I felt, you know, and so there was an opportunity to just talk about that and who's responsible and how it gets calculated and stuff like that. So, um, getting back to your question, I, I think it's, it's, you know, just letting people ask questions, no matter how crazy they might seem to you, is a good way to start and keeps, keeps you on your toes, really. Nadia? Um, yeah. I, I've had a, a lot of really interesting conversations with, um, with ranchers, uh, talking about just the soil and it's i don't use um i'm not i'm often not reporting on a story that is and i'm not doing a lot of reporting these days but that is climate change i'm re reporting on a story that is uh more specific to that uh drought their um the economics of their farmer situation um and when we wander back to so how as kathy was saying how how is this different than when you were a kid here. Those conversations can become much more um, interesting when you start with something specific. Um, and 
then broaden it out to why is this happening? And it does, it is frustrating that it often ends up with a conversation uh, stopper around anthropogenic climate change. And do we have to agree that if, if people can fix it, do we have to agree that people caused it? And I've kind of reached the point where I don't need to have that conversation as long as we can get to the, if people can fix it part, I don't care what whoever I'm talking to is blaming it on. As long as they feel um, that it's happening, they see it on their ranch, uh, they see it on their farm, um, and uh, and they can understand the different places we might have agency to fix it. So um, I, those are good conversations as far as I'm concerned. Those are really good conversations. The hardest conversations I have, have I hopefully are behind us now, but I'm really not reporting in this way anymore. Um, scientists who are mad at the media make it extremely difficult to continue having a conversation with them. Because uh, you're like, the story isn't about me and we can talk about media failures, but it never is a very good thing because it's never the story you're there to report. So to have to get that out of the way. And for many years, um, I was a Scripps fellow concentrating on climate issues in 2005. And I kind of felt like every expert we had had to clear their throat by screaming at us for a while. And that became something the journalists just had to let happen. And they're like, okay, terrific. Let's talk about what's going on in your ice field for a while. Let's go look at your ice cores. So that's, those are the hardest, honestly, the hardest conversations for me. I'm used to being yelled at by other people um, for other reasons. Yeah, well, I think that was encapsulated in that scene with DiCaprio's character <laughs> needing to yell at the journalist and they might've deserved it in that scene, but um, okay. Uh, Dave. So uh, let's see, I'll just go back a little bit to we, Nikki Fear, who uh, is at the University of Montana, and I started a course on climate issues, climate and energy issues in Montana, where we bike across the state uh, almost 15 years ago. And I was shocked at how many people there were to talk to about climate issues uh, across central Montana. Um, and that, that course has continued for, for quite a while now. And I guess, um, what I would say for conversations that go well is it's actually surprising how many conversations go well. I think we often assume and sort of over assume in some cases, um, just a level of like incredible divisiveness and conflictiveness around these issues. And that is certainly there. But in my experience, people moderate, you know, if they have extreme views, they moderate them for you when they sort of know where you're coming from. Um, and I've actually found it fairly hard outside of like political demonstrations to have like a real shouting match with anyone about climate issues. Um, and so I feel like in some cases, we're maybe too afraid to bring it up um, or more afraid than we should be uh, in many cases. Um, and especially, you know, if you use some, just some uh, situational awareness uh, to, to bring up the issues, it generally goes pretty well. Um, Another thing I, I did this fall was I, I rode around the American West just by myself, bike touring, and just sort of challenged myself to bring up climate issues with almost anyone I had any sort of conversation with. And um, I met, for example, uh, a motorcyclist who was riding from Texas to uh, Bellingham, Washington, and was from one of the biggest oil producing counties in Texas, and just sort of because we were both traveling on two wheels, we struck this conversation, and uh, and I, you know, led the the conversation to climate, and he was actually quite open to listening and said like his next motorcycle was probably going to be an electric motorcycle, <laughs> and I I was really surprised like I didn't expect that from him, uh, so I guess I just encourage people to to bring it up and just try it and and see what happens. It's generally far better than we expect. Thank you. Um, well, now we want to turn to some questions from the audience. And um, uh, maybe you have a story about someone you'd like to have a climate conversation with and tell us why, why that seems challenging. Or 
um, uh, a memorable moment from the holidays, or maybe you just have another question or a comment. I'm just checking in our chat here. A question for Nadia. Can you expand on who the trusted common sources are that you asked to speak on issues? Uh, yeah, I, I, who is that, Constanza? Um, sure, as I said, the surprise to me was the emergence of insurance people as trusted, as trusted sources. Um, they were out in front of this uh, be because their actuarials were saying, what's gonna cost us money in the long run? How are we gonna adjust you know, insurance? You can hate insurance, but they're looking into the future like nobody's business, it's their, it's their business. Uh, so that's an example. Other examples are um, often the military has taken the lead on um, uh, climate issues. And what I'm really saying here, when these are common sources that people can trust, uh, for other people on both sides will also not trust these sources, but these are sources that, in my experience, um, con more conservative people will trust. If we're really talking about a liberal conservative divide, which is not the only divide when it comes to talking about climate change, I think there's lots and lots of ways to slice the divide. But those are examples of sources that are good to talk to. Um, you know, people who are trusted in a given community and who are if you have someone who changes their mind about climate change in a given community, they can become a very effective communicator. Um, and I think that uh, people have worked hard to prevent that from happening publicly. I mean, we've seen that in our current kind of political milieu where changing your mind is not okay. Um, so when people do change their mind, that experience is a very, powerful one to share and they become powerful voices because they've really um, thought it through for themselves. So, so maybe those are examples. I hope that is kind of what you mean. Thank you, Nadia. We have another uh, question, a couple more questions in the chat. Oh, how do you affect change with a billion people? It's a great question. I think it's just one at a time and it's going to take, take a minute. Um, but um, a question for Dave Morris, how do you start a conversation about climate change with people you had just met? I feel like it can be a bit difficult to bring up the issue without being aggressive. Thank you. That's from Elena. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you sort of just got to tear the bandaid off to some degree. Um, but if there's some basis of connection you have with that person, then um, uh, that even a little toehold of connection can give you a, a, the basis to, to raise the issue. Um, when I was bike touring, um, people were just approaching me to ask like what I was doing, where I was coming from, all that standard kinds of questions. And I would just say, I'm doing a climate themed bike tour ahead of the, the UN climate meetings in Scotland. Um, and just bring it up that way and sort of ask like, hey, how, what do people where you live think about climate issues? And so I would try to deep personalize it a little bit, not say, what do you think? But what do people where you live or people around you or your neighbors or you know, in your community think about climate issues? Like, and then from there, like, do you see any impacts of, of climate on things that, that matter to you? I can talk about things that it's impacting that affect me. Um, so uh, it's 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 a bit ticklish and it's it's hard, especially the first couple of times you try to do it, but it does get a bit easier. I almost think that um, bringing it up with people who you do know is um, as important, if not more important, uh, than getting you know just rank strangers um, because. As as we're saying, like there, people just don't talk about it with uh, with friends and family, and those are the people you probably have the most connection with and influence on as well. I I find that talking about the weather is is a great way to start a conversation with almost anybody, and even though you know no particular weather event is necessarily directly related to climate change most of them most of them are a lot of them are and it's just a good 
just a good way to break the ice with people is to just talk about the weather and what they've seen and what they how it compares to what they've seen before and that kind of thing. Um, and then you can always kind of lead into climate change as the broader umbrella for that. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Paul Wheaton asked, uh, how do you affect change with a billion people? Does anyone, who wants to tackle? Start with that one. <laughs> um, I, I, I will. Um, and th this probably isn't uh, news to many people listening, but um, there's strong social science saying that if you move three and a half percent of a nation's population towards active engagement with an issue, change is almost inevitable, right? So three and a half percent um, is, is a lot of people, you know, in the US, that would be about 11 million people. Um, but if you knew 200 people, that would be seven people, right? They get seven people out of everyone you know, like off the sidelines to show up at demonstrations, to write letters to the editor, to uh, contribute to political candidates who are out there and active on climate. Um, so I think it, uh, that has really helped me uh, just feel like there's, there's a way forward um, in dealing with, um, you know, moving the population that direction. I also feel like even people who won't uh, maybe say it explicitly or do things um, outwardly to, um, uh, to help better our climate, I think there's a lot of implicit understanding and a lot of implicit worry and um, concern that's there. And um, you know, if we're moving the people from, you know, the concerned category or the cautious category towards the alarmed category uh, of the six climate Americas, um, we're, we're doing good work. And that's, I think, one of the most important things we can do. Thank you, Dave. Well done. I think I'm going to um, move on. Paul, I see your other question, and, and we'll, we'll, we will get to it. Um, uh, I want to move on with the next uh, section. For um, well, once you can see something, <laughs> I think that's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of being able to see something in actuality for a situation to really be real. And the moment of taking it seriously is so very critical. Um, and here in Montana, you know, the impacts of global warming have been much more acute in the last several years. Um, and it seems like these moments are really happening across that political spectrum. And I know I've certainly heard a few stories. I know I'm sure all of you have as well. You know, just a couple of recently for me, I was just in Lewistown, Montana, which is in Fergus County, beautiful community, central Montana. And um, I think I mentioned I'm in Leadership Montana and we uh, connect with a lot of different leaders of each communities that we go visit each month and uh, have this really wonderful panel, three ranchers, um, <laughs> uh, very, uh, thrown into the fire man who had been working one year as the director of emergency services for Fergus County <laughs> and um, just a handful of other great business owners and longtime community folks there. And, you know, that was uh, climate and what is happening um, with climate change, how that's affecting ag yields, how that's affecting their production, how that's affecting their quality of life, their way of life um, is just top top, top, top of the heap as far as what are some of those really important issues that that community in particular is facing, you know, and we're seeing wildfires in December in Montana. I mean, that is, I would, I would say that's unprecedented. So, <laughs> um, you know, and we keep hearing just lots of other, you know, stories and instances of, you know, these really odd weather events that are occurring more and more and more. And, um, so as we've talked about reaching across that political divide, um, what about simply engaging those folks who are already worried? Um, and so there is, Winona pulled some really great um, metrics here. Uh, according to some research done by the Pew Institute, only 24% of Americans have taken action on climate in this last year. And that's, you know, I know Paul and a couple others have mentioned in the chat, um, you know, what can one person do? Um, 
how do we connect with each other out of these impactful moments, just like Leonardo DiCaprio is out there standing in the middle of the street, seeing this comet, you know, we're seeing wildfires in December and Colorado is seeing wildfires in December and, you know, the list goes on. Um, how do we connect with each other out of these really impactful moments and build toward change together? And I'll just, again, pick on our panelists here. Um, Nadia, would you like to lead us off? Yeah, you bet. Thanks. I think that's a great question. And, and I think we've really turned a corner um, since of from the screaming scientists. Um, I think that uh, there's a few tropes that don't happen as much anymore. And I think how do we um, work together? Uh, I think it's easier in many ways to do that in multifaceted intersectional policy conversations where more than one thing is at play and it uh, is better for you know, climate policy, for carbon em emission reduction, for um, whichever targeted action you'd like to take to find that it's intersectional. And you know, I've been thinking of this story. Don't anybody steal my story because I, I really like the story. I just don't have if I have time to do it. Somebody will do it for me. So Missoula's got this um, bunch of poplar trees that they planted a long time ago over by the sewer treatment facility. And it was kind of billed as a uh, carbon sequestration project early on. And it doesn't actually work. Everybody loves the trees, but they're not really sequestering enough carbon to make a difference. And I, and, but it got the conversation going. And so they're now looking at, so we got to get rid of these trees because it's actually carbon inefficient in the end to harvest them and to find, get them to market was ultimately the problem. Um, but it, it put this bunch of land next to the sewage treatment plant in Missoula into the conversation, into the climate conversation space and a lot of different voices can talk about this one space. And in that conversation, thinking about the complexities of climate uh, solutions, th the trees were great. They were sucking up carbon like crazy. The problem was the market for the trees and getting them to that market. So now they're thinking, I think about just leasing it for hay and having a bigger climate impact because they can get it to market without such a long distance truck project. But the point is people loved the idea that this land was had the potential to address climate, a, a, a climate solution. So I think putting real tangible solutions into play, even in small spheres, initiates a conversation that brings unexpected actors to that conversation. And I think in the best world, journalism can do that. And I'm not a super sunshiny solutions person, but I think solution conversations are more nuanced and interesting now than they have ever been. Great, thank you. Yeah, and it's just, you know, again, that's starting that, you know, whether, whether, you know, the trees are not, we're working or not, it was that, you know, the ability to start that conversation. Yeah, that's so spot on. Um, Dave, do you have some thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I think that, uh, so if we're, if we're talking about how uh, people who are already worried to sort of become more engaged, um, I think that is where uh, the idea of solutions comes up. And um, what I am always telling students is climate change is such a vast issue. I mean, it affects almost every, anything you can think of. And in many cases, looking at it with looking at those issues with a climate lens, some of the overwhelm that people feel when they sort of want to be engaged, but they're not, is that they don't feel like they, uh, they can't address all of it, right? And so I really encourage people to find something that you are passionate about, that really matters to you, that you have some, you know, facility or ability in, and work on that. Um, and that, you know, is with students, but I think that also applies to uh, lots of other people. And uh, I mean, one thing that I find among young people often is a real sort of uh, just kind of depression about like what is going on and a feeling that there's not much that they can actually do to, um, to get engaged with it. 
And so I just keep a kind of a file of, of ideas and solutions that are really, and really I encourage people with any sort of is a great um, Australian American engineer who has done amazing work on um, kind of the technical side of decarbonization. And there's a lot there. And one of his key points is like the solutions need to be better than what we have now. And fortunately, many of them are like electric cars. When we have enough, the charging infrastructure are better. Um, cooking with an induction burner is better. Uh, using, you know, heat pumps is more efficient and better in many ways. Um, and so, you know, highlighting things like that, that sort of, get people moving and and finding ways that they feel they can be engaged whether it's technically or socially or educationally or you know whatever hands on things you can do uh, moving because taking it is often the hardest thing and then you're moving and that's the approach that I try to take with when trying to get people um, going on this stuff. Thank you. Um, Dr. Whitlock, do you have some thoughts on that, on how to kind of rally the troops once we've found some agreement there? Yeah, I haven't talked to anyone um, across the state that isn't worried about climate change at some level. They're worried about fires. As you said, we've had these crazy fires just exploding in the middle of the winter. Um, you know, we've had, we're still in extreme drought in parts of Montana. Um, we've had high temperatures. I haven't met a single person that's not worried about that. It doesn't matter what where the, how they fall politically. So that's that's great. That's common ground, and that's common ground to build on. Um, and and I so I have to tell a story that I was in Roundup talking to a bunch of people, and they had a moderator there. And before I started talking about climate change, he went around the room. There were about thirty of us, and he asked every person. He said, "I have two questions for you." One is, do you believe in climate change? And the other is, how much precipitation have you gotten on your ranch since January? Well, as you can imagine, as we went around the room, a lot of people didn't believe in climate change or they thought climate's always changed through geologic time and we've had dinosaurs and it was warmer and that kind of stuff. But everybody knew to about a quarter of an inch, how much precipitation they'd gotten on their ranch since January. Um, they knew it was such precision, I couldn't have possibly answered that question for Bozeman. And they knew how compared to the year before and the year before that and, and why they were worried and, and that sort of thing. And that's the common ground, that's the divide. I mean, as, as Nadia said, we don't have to agree on the cause of climate change, but we certainly can be worried about the impacts and, and see common ground there. And so I think we need to remind people that even if they don't believe in climate change, they're actually adapting to climate change. They're planning for climate change. Um, climate change is happening and, and adaptation or planning for it is, is really you know, where we can all come together, let alone all the ways we can reduce our carbon footprint. that Kathy totally in agreement there um one you know second question in this little section that we're working on here is you know and I think you all have kind of touched it in different ways um is how do we meet people where they are and uh a lot of you know I know I, we find this issue a lot of times with our organization um and uh you know, figuring out, finding that commonality, finding those those shared interests, those shared um, experiences has been so powerful for us. And um, again, it's been really fun for me. With COVID, we've been just so locked down. You know, the last couple of years, we haven't been able to get out and hold events and see people, and we've just really been stuck at home. And I live in Bozeman, and um, I'm sure lots of you people here live in Bozeman, men in Bozeman. Um, it's very different than it was when I moved here in the mid '90s, and uh, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and uh, 
Bozeman is great, but it's a lot different than where I grew up. And so when I get out into Montana and, uh, you know, um, some of some other folks have worked in Wyoming in the past and some of these more rural areas, I feel so at home. And so it's very easy to have those conversations, you know, just being in Lewistown, I made friends with the auctioneer, found out about what was happening with a stock sale that was happening there that is unfortunately directly related to climate. Um, there was a rancher there that was overextended with the bank. Um, it did not get the hay yields that he needed to feed his cattle. And so to solve two problems um, was selling off half of his herd. And, you know, growing up on a farm and having our, you know, we had to, we ended up selling our farm due to a lot of different, you know, issues, but similar issues to what Montana ranchers deal with, which is, you know, it's just tough. It's tough to make a living in the ag world these days. So, you know, getting back to how do we meet people where they are, um, while we're still kind of sequestered, <laughs> sequestered a, a bit during COVID, do you, you know, do you guys as panelists have thoughts on that? Um, Nadia, do you want to kick us off a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question um, because it's fundamental to this question of, of what does journalism do about climate change? Like, what is journalism's role in uh, in, in all of this and in sharing in, information um, about science, about policy? Uh, I think how do you meet people where they are in a journalistic context is often uh, through the beat reporting of things like that climate change. I, I actually think it's, sorry, I think it's very important that there is a climate expert and a climate desk on your news staff. But I also think it's very important that everybody else knows how to ask climate conversation questions. So I think your sports reporter has got to be able to have a conversation and write stories or do produce broadcasts about how climate change is impacting sports and how sports is impacting climate change. And the same with your entertainment uh, and literature, if, if you're lucky enough to have a book reviewer, you know, all of these people bringing climate conversations up in the milieu of your audience. So get your Super Bowl story on climate change out there. Get your climate impact story about food out into your food co food columns, into your the places where people who are passionate about those things are bringing themselves. You've already got the audience. So I think that that's how in journalism it happens. Harder to happen in the hard news stories. And I think simply hard news audiences are in shorter supply than they used to be. I think you see this on uh, plenty of your websites, news websites. So um, hard news is what it is. It's going to be uh, climate policy, climate impacts, science uh, studies and findings. But throughout the rest of your news consumption experience, you should be finding climate stories, uh, not disguised as anything else, simply where they actually are happening, which is in all of the aspects of our lives. No. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dave, do you have some thoughts? You know, I know you talked about that a little bit previously, um, you know, connecting with that gentleman uh, on his motorcycle from Texas. But, you know, from your journeys, have you found different, easier ways to, you know, while you might be different, how can we, um, you know, how can you start to figure out how to meet people where they're at with their climate, individual climate journey? Um, well, yeah, I think I was saying maybe a little bit about this before, if, if I have the send position, I just want to ask them as many questions as possible and be, um, just as honestly inquisitive as I keep um, and just build some kind of relationship in that way. Um, that's one thing. And then I think the other part of it is you, I don't think are, you know, is, is very helpful and people can sense when you're, you're being true to yourself um, and to your beliefs. And I think uh, that honesty about your concern and about uh, the issues that really matter to you, I think builds a relationship um, and is, is more effective than, um, 
sort of like soft pedaling things that you're actually quite passionate about. Yep, totally agree. Um, Dr. Whitlock, do you have some additional thoughts there about, you know, while you might not see exactly eye to eye on everything on the, <laughs> the spectrum of life, um, you know, how can you, you know, figure out how to meet folks where they are as it relates to climate? I think the COVID shutdown has been a big setback for meaningful discussions about climate change to diverse groups. I mean, at least I, our team used to get out and give talks all the time and have conversations and cups of coffee with all kinds of people about how they felt about the, the climate and, and other things that were going on. And, and that's all come to a stop. So it's been, for me, it's been really frustrating and a little depressing. Um, and I know that a lot of people, especially young people, are really, you know, so mentally stressed about climate change that they don't know what to do. And it's, it's just added on to the heap of other things that are stressing them. So there's this term solastalgia. Solis Have you heard that? It's, just, it's, it's distress of environmental change. And I think a lot of us suffer from solastalgia or climate grief or eco anxiety, put your name on it. And so we need to be sensitive to that and um, also um, give people hope that there, there actually are a lot of solutions that we can tackle with climate change. And a lot of the technologies are out there. They just need to be scaled up. We just need to buy into them. We don't need to wait for a technological fix to solve these problems. We've got it in our toolkit. And, you know, we can talk about this maybe later, but there's so many things that we can do that will make a difference. So try to be hopeful. It's hard even, for, you know, I have a hard time being hopeful, but that's where we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. And it's so funny. We, I was just having a conversation earlier today with one of our staffers at the Mamas. And, um, you know, we both have remarked, we're both parents. We both are crazy lives at this moment. And we had that same sense of exhaustion. And, you know, we've really been carrying that around for a couple of years. And so, you know, the work that we're trying to us and Winona and, and Climate Smart Missoula, all these groups are trying to do to make, you know, some, some good headway with climate seems, um, very daunting with everything else that is going on in our, in our lives. And so, you know, Dave was talking about just, you know, figuring out what are those, you know, what are those, the steps don't have to be huge. Um, you know, what's are some of those? And uh, I've been trying to do that on a, just a very personal level with myself and our family. It's just, I walked to work today. <laughs> and while that might not solve climate, you know, every day it's, it was a little thing that I did today. Um, so, um, I think we're going to move on here. Oh, wait, um, does anyone have, I think we've got a couple, just a couple minutes for a couple, you know, one or two questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, I thought Becky, I'd jump in because I've been watching the chat a little bit and there's some great things coming in. And for those of you sharing resources and um, uh, for our audience, we will be sure to include those in our follow-up email and just list them as audience resources. So thank you for sharing those. Um, Constanza had an, another question about, um, you know, acknowledging, Kathy, that you hit the nail on the head when you said the problem is that people don't think it affects them. How can we talk to raise awareness about the personal community impacts of climate change when we also always want to stay positive to ensure we don't turn them off? Um, and I just like to, to complicate that a little bit to say it sounds like there's a like the growing, there's a real growing awareness that it does affect people. So you want to address that, Kathy? Um, you know, there's always, I don't know if you've listened to these conversations about should you tell people that they should be hopeful, and then people say, well, no, you shouldn't be hopeful, you should be angry, and all of these things, and so, you know, I think, I think there is reason to be hopeful, because there's more and more of us that are getting on the same page, and that are realizing that this is a big problem, um, and it's not going to go away, no matter no matter what we do today, we're still going to experience warming. And I, I, I think we need to we need to gather around that hope and turn that hope into action. We have we have the scientific information. 
we need to always be trying to put it in a way that people can understand and that relates to them. But then we need to also take the next step of, of turning it into really to action, both at the national and international level, but of course in our own backyard. And I know a lot of people on the call today are, are really involved in local efforts. So, you know, it's great to see, to see them so engaged. So I'm gonna share one more scene from the film. Um, here's the spoiler alert for those of you <laughs> who haven't seen the film and maybe don't want to watch this last scene, but it's going to be hard to avoid. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> Got it. Um, that hit me a little stronger than I thought it would, seeing it for the third time. Um, <laughs> so it's a very intense scene and obviously the moment we want to avoid, and I'm going to pass it back to to Becky for a few more questions. Um, go ahead, Becky. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's very blunt and, um, you know, certainly not out of the realm of possibility. So, um, you know, on a micro level, this is what's happening in our communities around politicized issues as we shout at each other as social media, um, you know, continue to disconnect from each other due to the pandemic and other issues. Um, and <clears throat> our connections with each other because of all of that are really splintering. We're losing that, you know, that ability to come back and find those, those commonalities and build upon that. And um, uh, I'd love, yeah, we'd just love for us to, you know, talk here a little bit more about how to stay connected despite everything in the world. And, you know, there's a different, you know, metaphorical fire every single day. Um, and so in the face of um, everything is going on um, crisis wise in our world currently, how do we stay calm and willing to connect? Um, and uh, Nadia, I might start with you on that one from your experience. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I, I think it's profoundly intergenerational. I think it, um, I think the answer is different for different people in different times of their lives. And I think it's probably hopefully also cross-generational, which is hard if you don't have uh, kids or live near your parents, which is my case. Um, so uh, how do we stay connected? Um, I don't think I have a, a really a journalistic example, although I'll try to come up with one. I, I do think there is fabulous climate change journalism going on. It's in very specific niche places. So it's not great at reaching people who aren't looking for it. But I think that community forms around things, uh, you know, all of the groups that are represented here, but also things like just reading inside climate news, it, reading, covering climate now, listening to, um, to any one of the many podcasts that are out there actually creates community even inside of COVID. If we're still a little locked down, you can still then have a community that reaches across your friends group, talk to your high school friends from far away, talk to your neighbors. So shared, kind of creating shared experiences that are available to all of us through, through our media is one way to do that. And I, I also highly advocate leaving your media behind, um, but <laughs> for other shared experiences, but that'll be my answer there. Thank you. Um, Dr. Whitlock, do you have some thoughts there about how to stay calm and <laughs> despite everything that's moving ahead and, and still wanting to connect or still trying to connect? I mean, I think if COVID's taught us anything, it's the importance of being kind. Um, to trying to think about what other people's experience is. Um, and, and climate change is a lot of that COVID reality, but it's just playing out over a more punctuated, gradual timeline. Um, you know, so I mean, think about what the ranchers are going through, the crazy price of beef or what people are doing in the face of drought, um, the concerns that wheat growers have or, or people on the reservations who deal with water quality issues and health issues all the time. We just need to you know, realize even if we don't feel it all the time that we're part of this community or this community of Montanans who are 
trying to grapple with environmental change and it's happening to us. And there are a lot of solutions and there are a lot of things that we can do to plan for change. And as I, as I was saying before, I think no matter what happens, we have to plan for climate change. It's happening and being a person of action Having a plan is a good thing, you know, let's start thinking about where the vulnerable populations are. Let's start thinking about the conduits and bridges that aren't going to survive. Let's start getting our buildings in shape. Having a plan is a good thing and that can bring people together. Yes, definitely. Planning is just, yeah, so important. Um, Dave, do you have some, <clears throat> some thoughts there about how to how to stay calm and, and keep connecting. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely support what uh, Nadia and Kathy said, um, that we need information, we need to you know stay engaged ourselves, and we need to think about like the practical aspects of the challenges we face from climate. But I also think that some of the genius of that movie is, compressing the, the time frame of this that disaster that was about to happen. And that scene around the dinner table shows people just really connecting and really understanding, hey, we just have these moments together. And you know, almost all the time we're we're not really cognizant of that reality. Um, and I think in some ways uh, connecting with that, like what we have now is amazing. And it may be better than in some ways than what will be here in the future. Let's really be here and live this and, and really feel the connections to each other and to the places we live and to um, just this world that we love. And I think that uh, wise and effective action springs from that kind of connection. Um, you know, we see in our, in our country and around the world, lots of divisiveness now, I think because of the stresses that the world is under, you know, from climate and from COVID and um, many other things. Um, but that's not the only response to stress and anxiety, right? We, we can reconnect and uh, build stronger communities to respond to these these things, and um, I think that's part of what leadership is really about in these times: is finding ways to be honest and connected, and show that you really care, and demonstrate that you will do what needs to be done uh, to make this better. And you know, there's lots of people who you know on this call who are who are doing this. And I would put Winona as someone I just know well, who is, um, who is really doing that work uh, exceptionally well. And I highlight her because I know that, 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 that many of you are doing similar things. And I just hope you'll um, keep hard and, and keep doing that connecting work. I echo that um, very much so. I've been a lucky, very lucky to work with Winona for about the past year. And um, it's just, she she does her work with her whole heart. And <clears throat> I just loved what Dave had mentioned there as far as being present. Um, man, I struggle with that. And uh, that's certainly my takeaway from tonight. Uh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> Um, before we wrap up here, I just wanted to ask our panelists if you could just give, you know, one or two words that would be, you know, encapsulate your tips on how to have effective climate conversations. And uh, I'm going to pick on you, Dave. Do you want to go first? Uh, I think I've basically <laughs> said everything I have to say about that, but just uh, being honest and inquisitive. And I guess I would also add, just be willing, be willing to be surprised. Um, I think oftentimes we, we think we know what someone thinks uh, or what their position is. And maybe we don't even really listen to what they're saying because we're sort of, you know, shorthanding it already. And just to like really listen to people and, and try to learn something new out of each conversation, I think. Yeah 
learning uh learning yourself is is <laughs> strangely uh one of the best ways for is towards education in a way yes so. yeah listening and being surprised two very very important things um kathy do you have just you know a word or two that would encapsulate your your advice to us i completely agree with dave um I think it's just practice, practice, practice. Just get out there and start talking to people. And, you know, maybe somebody will hurt your feelings and say something, you know, that you don't agree with, but just don't give up. Just keep talking to people. And um, as I said, start with the weather. <laughs> Everyone loves to talk about the weather and go from there. Thank you. Yes. And Nadia? Oh, I'm 100% on board with Kathy and, and Dave said, and just speaking from my own heart, it is watch your own buttons. Know your own buttons. Uh, makes us all better listeners. Uh, and that's really it, what it's about, is uh, being a good listener so that you can engage. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, throw it over to Winona here to close us out. Um, okay. Thank you, Becky and everyone. Um, it was really informative um, evening tonight. I'll just add uh, for climate conversations, one thing, one mantra I have in my head when I'm having conversations is that my only goal is to have another conversation. That is my only goal. And that really changes, uh, helps me monitor my buttons and helps really change my energy in the conversation as opposed to convince, win, um, et cetera. Um, and ultimately you might end up in a better position uh, than you thought if you took another route. So um, I wanna take a couple, just a few more, I'll see if there's a few more questions. I think there's a lot of resources and comments being dropped in. Any, any last questions? You could drop them in the chat. Oh, Constanza, please, I see you raising your hand. Thank you, <laughs> go for it. Oh, thank you, really appreciate everything that's been said tonight. I also just wanted to um, bring up us, uh, that there's something that's happening in Montana in every corner of the state from conservative to liberal is a revival of the good neighbor guide handbook. And as I started talking to people, we, we originally a year ago with a group in the Flathead Valley that now we call ourselves the Flathead Climate Resilience War Group and we're collaborating with the Climate Smart Glacier Group. But we started talking about, oh, we need stories out in the media that basically talk about everything good that's happening from the farmhouse group to food to everything, you know, any, any kind of story. And, um, but we're seeing them, which is amazing. So we redirected a little bit. We're working instead on a guide with every agency and group you can imagine. Everybody just jumped on and said, yes, we've been thinking about it. And then we hear in Yellowstone, it's happening. It's happening in the Backfoot Challenge. It's happening everywhere. The University of Montana. So anyways, just wanted to bring that up. Uh, and I would love to collaborate with Nadia. Uh, if you have some, uh, lots of ideas starting to come up here. So thank you. And thank you, Kathy and, and Dave. Thank you, Constanza, for, for sharing that. And I can't wait to hear more about that project as it develops. Um, in the interest of time, I'm a person, I like to end events on time. I certainly don't want to stifle conversation, but I think it's important to end on time. So I'll take one more question. Um, if anyone has one, raise your hand, unmute, drop it in the chat. OK. I am not seeing anyone. Let me know if I'm missing. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, Paul, Paul has a question, it looks like. OK, go ahead, Paul. OK, unmute. Um, you know, having a conversation about the climate is, is in some ways, pretty straightforward. Um, you get to the point where you can tell which way the person you're talking to is going to go and kind of how to um, talk about the cause and the effects and so on. But my problem is, is trying to end a conversation, especially with people who are concerned. And throwing it out to the panel is, is how do you leave a conversation 
in a positive note and leave them with something they can do. That's As I said, I think the, the solutions are out there to bring us to carbon neutrality by 2040, 2050. Um, and we just, you know, we need to give people that hope that there, there's stuff they can do. And it's small things. It's everything from reducing food waste to protecting trees, to buying local, finding nature-based solutions for a lot of things. Um, I just watched Project draw down um, a series of, I don't know if you've seen those podcasts, Climate Solutions 101. It's great, it's, it's six podcasts and it, it's full of solutions. Um, so I always send people there if they have the time. It, it's, really a, it's really a good resource. I was just gonna say that, um, well, for, when I did uh, my bike ride, I had uh, little stickers <laughs> with uh, with my little website and you know some websites that are also like good resources. And so I think if you have something like that that can sort of connect someone, I think Project Drawdown is a really good one as well to direct people to, um, or Families for a Livable Climate or Climate Smart Missoula. Just something that is like a way forward that connects them to ongoing action. I think is is really helpful because you're not just sort of trailing off like wow this is tough. <laughs> uh, it's like here's here's a place to go to connect to other people who who feel similarly. Thank you. I would just yeah, hey Paul, I, I do deal with this so much from a, a younger like students perspective, and I, I'm pretty sure. Giving them something to do is not always what they want, but really listen, engaging and listening to them seems to help and um, not overwhelming them with resources or things to do. Uh, so, so a very kind of a practical thing, like let's, let's take this conversation out for a walk. Um, let's walk around the Oval. It's a thing that happens on campus here. Um, finding a way to solidify that connection and hand it off to the next person trying to that they're going to contact with connect with you know like hey have a good talk with your mom tonight i'll see you next class or something like that so i, I can be guilty of overwhelming them with the things they could be doing and i i know that that's not um, actually what they want from me <laughs> thank you um, i can add to that yeah yeah, I think um, having, knowing, we've talked so much about stories and knowing or having a story, a favorite story, maybe not of your own, but that you've heard and sharing that briefly and reminding people that the mass media pretty well shows us all the devastation and the things to be afraid of. And any kind of hopeful story in regard to climate change, um, you have to go looking for those. Remind people that they're out there and have one to share. Thank you, Christine. I would add, I'm gonna start, uh, they're getting more resources in the chat. That's so great. And we will share them. We're going to do a follow-up email after the event and we'll offer the recording and the resources. It'll probably um, hit your inbox early next week. Um, I'll just share too, coming out of tonight, the one of the most important things you can ask them to do is to have conversations. Um, if we're not talking about it, we won't care about it. And if we don't care about it, we won't change it. So to bring us full circle to Catherine Hayhoe, and I will share some res resources from her um, in our follow-up email that are very helpful for these conversations. I really um, need to just send such a huge thank you to our panelists, to Kathy and Nadia and Dave. I'm so grateful for your time and just trusting, even though you got the questions and outline like <laughs> 36 hours before the event. Um, I'm a mama jugg juggling COVID craziness and, you know, and what have you, but thank you so much for joining us and Becky uh, co-moderating with me. I wanna leave everyone with a quote 
Two quotes. To be hopeful means to be uncertain about the future, to be tender toward the possibilities, to be dedicated to change all the way down to the bottom of your heart. That's Rebecca Solnit. Uh, thanks go to Amy Sillenberg for passing that to me a few years ago. And the last quote for you to take away from one of my favorite climate leaders, um, Mary Anaïs Hegler. Don't worry about whether or not the world is ending. Figure out what you stand for and stand for it. Thank you, everyone. Have a really great night. <laughs>